Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Death Row Executions. Um, today's story is on Johnny Frank Garrett, and this story is dedicated to one of my subscribers who passed away on Christmas Day 2020. Um, I made this channel out of curiosity and was intrigued by other people's stories and sharing some of mine as well. I've made a few community posts in the past saying how I appreciated how many of you all were kind to each other and how it was a safe haven for many of you guys to open up and share things that some of you guys have never even shared with your closest friends. I truly appreciate when people open up and one of those people was Cuddlebug. I initially didn't know that that was her real name and we had a laugh about people misspelling my easy name and jokes she's heard about hers. She also opened up with me and the channel about her being a victim of a very serious crime and losing her legs because of it. When I found out she passed from her adoptive father, John, it truly hurt and I, she was unforgettable to me and I feel she was such a strong woman. Her parents were killed by her grandfather and it's so surreal because she mentioned that she had a plot picked out next to their graves. I asked her father some names of people she would like for me to feature, and Johnny's name came up. <sighs> I wish I could do more, and he told me that one of the last things she said was that she was going to miss another episode of Death Row Executions, and if he thought, I would be upset with her. She went to sleep, and she never woke up definitely not upset Cuddlebug and I pray you are resting in peace and your family is able to heal from this as well. Johnny Frank Garrett was born on December 24th 1963 in Oklahoma. His parents separated and when his mother remarried his stepfather raped him. The sexual trauma did not stop and his stepfather ended up forcing Johnny to have sex with other men and basically pimped him out. The sexual abuse continued to get worse, and as a young teen, he was forced to perform sex on camera, and all of the men around him were able to get away with creating child pornography and taking advantage of a minor. These men introduced him to drugs and alcohol at a very young age, and it's been said that some of his brain damage was due to him becoming addicted to paint thinner and amphetamines. If Johnny acted out or made his stepfather upset, he was hit. The physical abuse got so bad that he received a permanent scar on his body because he was placed on top of the stove while the burners were on. A mental health expert said that Johnny was psychotic, brain damaged, and mentally impaired. He only completed seven years of schooling before living a life of petty crime. Johnny lived across the street from the St. Francis Convent in Amarillo, Texas, and on the morning of October 31, 1981, Halloween Day, 17-year-old Johnny made his way into the convent by breaking through the window of their community room. He was wielding two knives and made it to where 76-year-old sister Tadia Benz was sleeping. When she noticed him in the room, he choked her until she passed out, had sex with her while she was unconscious, and left. Hours later, mass had started at 6.30 a.m., and other sisters noticed that Tadia was not in attendance. It was around 7.30 a.m. when a sister left to go check on her, and that is when she discovered her dead body. It wasn't until after an autopsy was conducted that they discovered she was raped and most likely murdered. A few months before this attack, there was another woman in her 70s in the area who was raped and murdered, so police assumed the cases were tied and they were looking for a Cuban refugee. It wasn't until November 9, 1981, 
when detectives were able to match fingerprints from Sister Tadea's room to that of Johnny Garrett's, and he was arrested that same day. While being questioned by detectives, Garrett supposedly made a confession by saying that when he made it to the second story where Sister Tadea's room was located, it looked like she was going to scream, so he forced his hand over her mouth and choked her until she passed out. He said he then had sex with her and left the same way he came in. When trial began the following year in August of 1982, although Johnny expressed his innocence, there was a lot of evidence that pointed to him as the killer. There were multiple witnesses that claimed they saw Johnny running from the convent or walking around in the area, despite him saying he was at home. Hair samples and fingerprints were found, and they had his confession as well. Johnny took to the stand and testified that he never confessed, and the detective questioning him would say something, and he would reply by saying, put it down, or go ahead and put that down too. He claimed that the detective made the confession himself with his assumptions, and he refused to sign it once it was complete. He did, however, admit that two days prior to the death of Sister Tadea, he was drunk and high on LSD and broke into the convent to steal a stereo. He said the only reason why his fingerprints were on the sister's headboard was because he used it for support as he was leaning over her bed looking for more items to steal. He also expressed that despite other eyewitnesses saying they witnessed him walking outside, he was at his mother's house until late morning on Halloween. In September of 1982, Johnny was found guilty of capital murder and he was sentenced to death by method of lethal injection. While on death row at the Ellis unit in Huntsville, Texas, more of Johnny's childhood trauma came to the surface. It was documented that he was more scared of people identifying him in a film he made as a child than he was with being executed. Psychiatrists were beginning to believe he had schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder, or what we know today as DID. Although not classified as insane, he was diagnosed with being chronically psychotic. During a clemency hearing, they spoke of one of his alters, Aaron Shockman, who emerged when he was in fifth grade after he was forced to film and was beaten that same day. He also did not fear being executed because he felt that his other alter, Aunt Barbara, would emerge at the time the lethal injection drugs were injected and take the pain for him. Although many did not believe her, a forensic psychiatrist by the name of Dr. Dorothy Lewis claimed that she believed Johnny took on an alternate personality of a woman by the name of Bessie when he committed the murder. A director by the name of Jesse Quackenbush believed that Johnny was innocent and even went as far as making a documentary called The Last Word which focused on the fact that Johnny was indeed an innocent man. He also tried to assert that police were initially looking for a Hispanic male and wanted the DNA to be retested to see if it matched that particular individual. He was able to get in touch with the district attorney, Rebecca King, and she released a letter that said, There are procedures of criminal and civil law that have to be met. We're not trying to hide anything. It's whether the case needs to be reopened or not. That's for a judge to determine. With the question in the air about whether or not Johnny was truly innocent, the sisters at the St. Francis convent were distressed. They felt that if the wrong person was convicted, Johnny's good name should be restored. Before Johnny's 1992 execution, Pope John Paul II reached out to Governor Ann Richards and he was able to convince her to give Johnny Garrett a reprieve. It was the first time since executions were reinstated back in 1976 that a governor in Texas had halted an execution. Like most death row inmates who get a stay of execution, it is most likely just a delay in their execution because the decision gets overturned. The case was reviewed again by the Texas Board of Pardons and Paroles and they voted against commuting Johnny's execution. His mental health, nor the fact that he was a minor when the crime was committed, played a factor in their decision. Execution day was February 11, 1992, and Johnny was 28 years old. For his last meal, he had ice cream, and for his last words, he said, 
I'd like to thank my family for loving me and taking care of me. The rest of the world can kiss my 22 years after the execution of Johnny Garrett, a detective by the name of Modena Holmes decided to look at a couple of old cases. One of those cases was that of Johnny Garrett. After looking through evidence, they found a sheet with a stain on it. At the time of the crime, the DNA was not tested on the sheet because they assumed it to be from Johnny. After testing the stain, they figured out that it was semen and it belonged to a Cuban refugee, Leoncio Perez Rueda, the man who police suspected well before suspecting Johnny. At the time of discovery, Leoncio was in prison serving time for another murder. He was also interviewed by Jesse, who came out with a documentary on Johnny, and he had admitted to raping a nun on Halloween two decades prior. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions and now for discussion and question time. With the new evidence of clearing Johnny of the crime, why do you think it has taken so long to clear his name? I found out that one of the prosecutors during Johnny's trial by the name of Danny Hill began to heavily drink after trial. He ended up getting busted for driving while under the influence and in 1995 he took his own life. Do you think it was the guilt of locking up an innocent man? What is the purpose of keeping someone on death row for 10 years and you can't even retest DNA? I don't get why the argument is to bring up their past when they should be looking at pertinent information that would actually get their sentence changed. Why the cover up and why the need to make Johnny the killer? It seems very negligent and we the American people are left thinking that the trial is fair and the evidence against someone on death row is 100% accurate or at least they're examining each piece of evidence before giving someone the death sentence. Let me know what you guys think in the comments below and if you enjoyed this video please give it a like for me.